Hey, what's up guys? I'm KBHD here and welcome to part five of the Hackintosh Pro Project, the finale. Let's go. Round one. <laughs> So now the Hackintosh Pro is a complete machine. It is finished. And in case you missed the first three episodes of the series, which are annotated right there, or there will be the first three links in the description below the like button if you're on mobile. Uh, but in case you missed the first three, uh, the basic purpose of this series was to create a beast of a video editing machine that will happen to dual boot Mac OS X and Windows. And there's been a ton of comments. So this video, this entire video, this finale, is meant to address all the comments and questions that I've got and basically wrap up exactly how this machine performs and what it does for the price you pay. So let's go ahead and get started. So as a refresher for the parts of this build, we're going to be centering it all around an Intel Core i7 3930K six core processor. And that's pretty much the center of the system and what we're building off of. So for that, we have an Asus X79 Sabertooth motherboard, and we have the Gigabyte GTX 670 Winforce Overclocked Edition 2 gigabyte graphics card. We also have the Corsair H80i. We also have three Vertex 4 SSDs and numerous other various components and accessories that we'll get to. But basically, the parts to this build are all linked down below, and a lot of you guys were asking for a total price, and that kind of fluctuates, but I have a PC parts picker linked down below, which will give you a graph of how the total price fluctuates over time. All these parts were put together in a fractal design defined R4 case, one of my favorite cases of all time that I've ever even seen, period. It's really good looking case. It's a silent inside case, and it's probably the best thing that I could have possibly picked for this project. Again, opinions may vary, but I love the R4, so that's the case we use. So in previous videos in this series, we've discussed why exactly we have those three Vertex 4 SSDs. These are all 128 gig SSDs. The first two are gonna be used, or are currently being used, as a Mac OS X RAID 0 striped array. And a second drive, or the uh, second part, will be for Windows 8. So there's three total drives. Two of them are a 256 gig RAID array for OS X, and the last one is a 128 gig drive dedicated to Windows 8. And because of this, after you go through the install process for Mac OS X, you can go ahead and insert the Windows 8 CD drive and install Windows 8 on the third drive just like any normal computer. And now, every time you boot, when you get into the bootloader, you will have the choice to boot whether you wanna go into OS X RAID or into Windows. Now, one of the easiest ways to get the most performance out of your system is to overclock it. And that's exactly what I've done. I went into the BIOS just like anyone else who's using this motherboard and CPU combination, and I overclocked the CPU. Uh, it comes out of the box stock at 3.2 gigahertz with a 3.8 gigahertz turbo, and uh, I bumped that up to a 4.35 gigahertz clock speed. So now we're running at you know 4.35 gigahertz for all the tests that we do. We're gonna go ahead and show you guys the benchmarks. When I ran these benchmarks, I was at 4.2 gigahertz, so I did eke out a little bit more performance, but the benchmarks that we used were Geekbench, Novabench, and Cinebench. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys the benchmark results we got for those. First benchmark here is a classic. It's the 64-bit Geekbench 2, a fairly well-known and well-trusted multi-platform treat. The highest 2012 iMac has been known to max out around 13,000 points, and that's where the $2,500 baseline 2012 Mac Pro picks it right up. And as you can see here, without screen recording, at 4.2 gigahertz, I got a score of 15,811. And I did run it again off camera after overclocking a bit more to, like I said, 4.35 and was getting a score in the low 17,000s. So that was pretty solid. Next up is Cinebench, which was a pretty fun benchmark to test both the CPU and the graphics card. So for the GPU test, we ran through the animation with the car chase scene and the reflections and physics, etc., uh, which was pretty neat. And we got a solid 34 frames per second. Uh, which is pretty good for a single card. And then the CPU test, which was basically a benchmark of pure raw data crunching, gave us a score of 9.13 points. So it, it's, it's pretty good. It's not touching the systems with two GPUs or two CPUs, but the, then again, we wouldn't expect it to. And for the price of these parts, it's a damn good performer, as you can tell. Last, we did Nova Bench, And as you may recall, the fastest Mac Mini in the World series concluded with a finale similar to this, where we got a Nova Bench score in the mid 900s. But of course, this is the Hackintosh Pro, and it blows it out of the water, scoring more than 1,600 points, and also showing our insane read-write speeds thanks to RAID 0 
around 700 megabytes per second. So pretty sweet performer. So now that we know that it performs well, what about the experience? Well, the OS X experience on a Hackintosh is one of the most curious parts about this build. A lot of people wanna know why you should get a Hackintosh over a regular Mac and if it's gonna be the same experience. Well, I've owned a Mac Pro for a couple of months and I can tell you that from experience, there is a lot similar between a Mac Pro and a Hack Pro and there is also a lot different. First of all, on the hardware side, there are some serious differences. I'll start with upgradability. When you're going with a Hackintosh Pro, you have far more upgradability than any other Apple desktop. So with a Hackintosh, you can change your power supply at any time. You can change your RAM, you can change your CPU, motherboard, whatever you put in that Hack Pro, you can switch out for whatever part you want and get it working. With a Mac Pro, you don't really see people replacing the motherboard or replacing the power supply. Those things really don't just happen. Usually the only things you replace in a Mac Pro are the graphics card, the RAM, and occasionally the, uh, actually, yeah, that, that, that's pretty much it. The hard drives, I guess. There's also a difference in dimensions, but this depends on the case that you pick for your Hackintosh. I happen to pick, like I said, the Fractal R4. It's a very good looking case, but it's also a little bit shorter and a little bit more squat than the Mac Pro case, which is a tall, slim aluminum tower with handles on top. Now you can build a Hackintosh in a Mad G4 case or a modded Mac Pro case to fit your motherboard. People have done that, uh, but personally I went with the R4 because it's, a, like I said, good looking to me. Uh, but there are other options you can get, so the difference in dimensions will vary based on what case you get. So another big difference between the Hack Pro and the Mac Pro is the I.O., the inputs and outputs that you get thanks to the motherboard. And there is a huge difference. You won't get nearly as much I.O. on the Mac Pro as you do on the Hack Pro. Uh, if you look at the back of the Mac Pro, you're going to get some USB ports, but not very many. You get some Ethernet, some Firewire. You don't get Thunderbolt on the new Mac Pro. It's weird that they still don't have that yet, but hopefully we'll see a new model of the Mac Pro. But right now, it's really, really limited. You flip it around to the front and you still only have two more USB ports and some Firewire. It's very limited. And then you have your headphone jack and your microphone jack. On the Hack Pro, you have a load of I.O. And you can see also the new Noctua fan that I threw in there. But basically, you have way more USB ports, you have way more uh, Ethernet, you have Firewire. You could get a Hackintosh Pro and use a motherboard with Thunderbolt support. I didn't, but that's an option for you if you want it. But other than that, you get the point. You also have the front I.O. on the Fractal R4 case. So you have not, not only the power button, but you have four more USB ports at least. And you have your headphone jack, microphone jack, and reset button. So there are way more I.O. options available with the Hackintosh. So processing power, how does it stack up? Well. That, you could say that that's one of the strengths of the Mac Pro. It's not a weakness of the Hackintosh, but the Mac Pro absolutely flies ahead of pretty much any of the competition uh, in terms of processing power. You can throw dual Xeons in your Mac Pro. It will be very expensive, but you can configure a very powerful Mac to outdo it. So it'll crush benchmarks. You'll get things like 18,000 on Geekbench, you know, 19,000 without even breaking a sweat. That being said, the six core 3930K is a very powerful single CPU system. And since we're using a single CPU system with a single CPU motherboard, this is a really good system. I've been using it to video edit and things like Premiere and After Effects and it works wonders. And then there's the graphics. Uh, the Mac Pro has some outdated graphics. I'm going to be perfectly honest, the 5870 is more than a year old and the applications we're using today are not that old and they need more power than they did when the 5870 came out. So when you're using a Hackintosh, you get to pick exactly what graphics card you want. I went with the NVIDIA GeForce GTX 670. That is light years ahead of the Intel or the AMD Radeon HD 5870 that was in my Mac Pro. Another advantage to the 670 is the CUDA cores. So you'll be able to use the CUDA cores on the graphics card. The basic way of saying it is that you can offset a lot of the power on onto the graphics card that you would normally be doing on the CPU. And this, the graphics card is like untapped power. A lot of people don't, you know, ever turn this on. But when you turn on CUDA, you know, After Effects flies. Uh, Premiere is really smooth. So being able to turn these things on is pretty important. And uh, you're supported with a lot of new cards. And the last major difference I'd say between the Mac Pro and the Hack Pro is the price per spec that you get. Now, if I were to spec out, you know, this Hackintosh, again, the PC Parts Picker link is in the description below. The equivalent Mac Pro is more than $1,000 more. In fact, you can't get a Mac Pro for the price that I built the Hack Pro. 
the lowest Mac Pro starts at $2,500, and even then, you only get, I think, six gigabytes of RAM and a regular hard drive. It's just not the same. With this, you're getting a six core, 12 thread processor, you're getting 32 gigs of RAM, you're getting a RAID 0 array. There's just no comparison. You get way more for your money, and that is probably the number one reason that people buy a Hackintosh, or at least build one over buying a Mac Pro. And then there are the little things like, you know, the noise. Uh, if you're video editing and audio recording at the same time, you don't want the fans kicking in when you don't need them. So again, the Mac Pro that I had was pretty quiet, but again, I went all out with the quietness with the Hack Pro. And so we went with the insulated R4 case uh, and we went with the, uh, actually a new Noctua fan on the back. So that's the NFP12 120 millimeter fan on the H80i's radiator. So all of these things are very, very quiet and uh, that's definitely a pro. The SSDs also have trim support in RAID 0. A lot of people didn't know you could do that, but MultiBeast allows you to do that, so there's trim. You don't have to worry about these SSDs degrading. There's also the even smaller things, like being able to tweak the About This Mac section to show exactly how awesome your specs are. Uh, there are instructions to doing all these things all over the internet, so you can show uh, exactly what the specs of your machine are and show uh, the case you use. And for any of you guys wondering, if stability is a major concern for you, once you get past the installation process, it's just as stable as a Mac Pro. From my experience, I haven't had any hiccups, I haven't had any uh, smoothness issues, frame rates are higher, uh, and animations are just as smooth, mission control, all the features work the same way. Stability is top notch. So for the Windows boot, a lot of you guys were asking about the Windows install because I didn't talk about it in the OS X install video. So the Windows 8 is what we decided to go with for the dual boot. Basically, you get an optical drive and you boot up just like you would boot a normal computer to the optical drive and you install Windows 8 to your SSD the single SSD that we're having outside of the RAID array. And that brings us into Vertex 4, Windows 8. Super fast SSD solution. You get very fast read write speeds with Windows 8, even if it's just one SSD, and it's significantly faster than you'd typically get uh, on a hard drive. Also, uh, I'm not a big gamer, but a lot of you guys were asking for some gaming performance, so I'll go ahead and leave you with a little bit of some max pain on the highest settings available on the GTX 670. Almost as much as I did. So a popular question I get about the Hackintosh Pro is the setup, the actual physical setup that I have, at least on my desk here. I was tweeting some behind the scenes pictures on you know, Twitter at MKBHD and some on Instagram too, but basically I'll go ahead and explain to you how this works because some things are a little bit different. All the way on the left here, I have the FIO E10. That's my amp and DAC or digital audio converter. I've done a video on these already. So that link I guess will also be in the description about why digital and audio converters are perfect. So these guys are what's powering all my audio. Those are what's powering these studio monitors and my iKey Audio, uh, or my ATH M50 headphones. These uh, are iKey Audio studio monitors too. So that's what the audio is coming from. The uh, M50s, by the way, are pretty awesome. You should check them out if you haven't already. And then uh, I'm using the Apple accessories here. So pretty much any wired or wireless Apple accessories will work, uh, even Bluetooth stuff. So if you get a little Bluetooth adapter, you'll be able to throw these in. So I'm using the Apple wired keyboard because I like to be able to throw it into my BIOS at any time if I want to tweak an overclock or anything. And I'm using the Bluetooth Magic Trackpad as well. So that's what's allowing me to use Mission Control and a lot of other features that you kind of need the trackpad to use for those gestures. I would never use a Magic Mouse. Just no. Uh, and then there's the Cyborg Rat 9. It's not the best mouse in the world just because of the battery life, but it is pretty damn customizable. So I recommend it to those of you who want a wireless customizable mouse. And a lot of people also ask about the displays. So this is a Dell UltraSharp 3007 WFP-HC. Uh, it's a 30-inch 2560 by 1600 display. And then over here is a 20-inch portrait display. Uh, it's, uh, again, a 1600 by 1200. So the reason I have this portrait is because they match up perfectly. So they're the same height 
and they're the same vertical resolution. So I end up with a resolution of 2560 plus an extra 1200, and then I get, you know, 1200 vertical and 1200 vertical here. So when I move windows across, it doesn't resize or anything. And then the way I have my workflow set up for mission control is I have three spaces up here. Uh, desktop one is just for normal stuff. Desktop two will be where I use Premiere, and then desktop three will be where I have After Effects, and then I can swipe between these three as I go. You know, I might be downloading things from the internet, and then I swipe up and bring that into Premiere, and then bring that into After Effects. So the whole project cycle works pretty well with that. Uh, but that's just so you guys know how I use these displays on a daily basis, especially when I'm video editing. So the elephant in the room now is, um, is this technically legal? Is it legal to make this run OS 10? Well, technically, no, this is not legal. Apple does not want you to do this at all, but I'm not responsible for anything you may do as a result of watching the videos in this series. But if you're watching this series, you probably already have a good idea of what you wanna do anyway. Overall though, I'd say the Hackintosh Pro project has been a success. It has been quite the workhorse of a machine, perfectly stable, very usable. Uh, animations have been smoother, frame rates have increased, buffer and render times have decreased. It's just been an all around great machine to own. And uh, the satisfaction of building it yourself is kind of like Legos for adults, as Dave Dugdale has said, uh, having the ability to, to pick all your own parts and uh, the satisfaction of getting it together is really fun. So. That has been it. That's been the Hackintosh Pro project. I guess now we'll return to our typically scheduled, not really scheduled, but our normal programming of MKBHD videos. We got some more comparisons and smartphone stuff coming up. But either way, this has been fun, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks for the thumbs up and all the new subscribers as a result of this project. Hi, welcome aboard. And uh, I'll talk to you guys all in the very next video. Thanks for watching, guys. Peace.